Okay, so this is the video for week three. Um, this video will be done in at, at least two parts. So we're going to talk about what's called data pre-processing. And onto our ladder, last week was about exploring and obtaining data. This week is about the pre-processing step. Um, and then after this week, everything will be um, data mining techniques. Okay. So data pre-processing effectively is preparing the data for data mining. Okay. That's really the best way to think about it. Um, it's possible your data is already ready and you don't have anything to do, but we need to talk about what you might need to be able to do. Um, the first issue is the issue of unclean data. Now, again, there is the data wrangling course that's going to cover all this. So we are actually not going to actually do this as lab work. The data that you will work in for this course should be already cleaned. But I do want to talk about data cleaning issues because they are an important part of data pre-processing. So data cleaning is all about diag diagnosing and correcting uh basically messes in your data, inaccurate and inconsistent data. Okay. I spent the summer and did research and did a bunch of curriculum work and started the stuff for data wrangling. Basically, there's kind of 12 categories of dirty data that you should be able to recognize. Um, the data wrangling course, again, is going to actually cover like how to do this. That's going to be a variety of techniques. I think there's going to be some Excel and some programming. I honestly haven't done the actual like exercises. I just did like the content stuff. So this, these are the types of issues that you can have with unclean data, the 12 issues. Issue one is issue of data type. And that occurs when, for example, you ask people's age and you mean for them to respond numerically like they're 18. And then some people actually write in 20 as a word. And then you have data that is incorrectly entered as character data in a numeric field. Um, so that's like the first sort of way of creating unclean data. Second issue is data range issues. And this can happen when you ask like a date and you get somebody entering like the year is 2300 when they meant to ask, they meant to do like 2023. I don't know how they do it, but they do because people, you know, people make mistakes all the time. Um, and, you know, you could also ask age and maybe somebody would respond that they're like 210 years old instead of 21 because they actually type a zero. So that's an issue. And you can detect range issues by doing like min and max and just looking at frequencies and stuff. A lot of the stuff really, um, you can really detect a lot with just a basic frequency table. Issue three is uniqueness. Um, Sometimes this is a problem and sometimes it isn't. This can happen, like, for example, in, like, sales data and there seems to be a double double entry of the same transaction. There should be, like, a unique transaction ID. It's possible it's a duplicate. It's also possible that somebody actually did buy, like, the same thing twice. Um, issue four, I say, is, quote, easy text errors. And this is, like, spelling and capitalization related issues. Because if you let people enter their data like in a form and let them type stuff in, they're not all going to be consistent. These are fairly easy to fix if you um, just convert everything to like all caps or whatever. Um, so there's ways to get around that. Issue five is set membership. And this would be something like if I asked you like what college year you were, you should be freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. You shouldn't like write in like second year or something that's not... Um, so set membership refers to like restricted categorical um, options. Issue six is key constraints. This relates to relational databases and um, unique keys for records in relational databases. Issue seven is pattern issues. This is commonly happens in like phone, phone numbers and zip codes when the phone numbers aren't typed in in the standard sort of like parentheses area code. Um, and then like seven digit number thing. Okay. Issue eight is cross field issues. This is a little, you have to actually look at both fields. This is when you would have like a birth date and a death date. And for example, um, a really good example of this would be if somehow the birth date were entered as after the death date, which obviously can't happen. So this is the, or, um, you know, you could do like years in college and somebody would enter that they're, they've been in college for no years and they're senior. That wouldn't make a lot of sense either. So that's kind of an issue with um, data quality and cleaning. 
Issue nine is missing data. Data mining is not as sensitive to missing data as other analytics is. Um, data mining, honestly, unless it's deleted on purpose and missing, like not at random, missing data really isn't that much of a problem for the algorithms we're going to use in this class. Um, issue 10, I very cleverly described as CRUD. Um, this is just like, particularly with text and character data, it's basically like random spaces and characters that shouldn't be in there that are just um, creating issues that you need to clean. Issue 11 is incomplete data. This is not the same as missing data. Missing data is not there at all, but incomplete data is something like um, they enter the town, but not the state. So there's data there, but it's not, it's partial data. Okay. Issue 12 is everything else that can occur. And so this actually creates like an organized way of looking at data or cleaning issues. I really, pretty much everything I have to clean, I could classify in these 12 issues. Um, but anyways, for this course, we are not going to actually clean data. In data wrangling, we will, trust me. Um, that's a spring course, okay? The other thing about data wrangling that, again, we're not going to do in this class, but I want to talk to you about, is modifying existing data fields. This is not cleaning. This is taking data that's in a column that you want to change to a little bit different representation, okay? So mod mod modifying data is a second tier of data pre-processing, cleaning being the first. Once the data is already cleaned, you need to modify the fields in some form. Um, so there's basically four ways to modify data. Change your variable names. That's actually a fairly simple thing to do. The reason you might want to do that is like if you're merging data, and let's say that there's the data that you're merging and the original data both have a column X that mean different things. You're going to have to change one of those to be something other than X if you're merging them together because you can't have two columns named X with different variables. Reformatting data, that would be something like you have phone numbers in one form and you want to reformat them. They're already clean, but you want to like strip out the area code or something like that. Um, joining or splitting fields, like if you want to join first and last name or split first and last name into separate fields. Um, the fourth one is probably the most common. And if you took, for example, stats with me, um, I'm not teaching stats one lately, but when I taught it, Grouping and binning data. So when you take continuous data and you do a frequency distribution, you can't just do the data individually. You have to group it like 10 to 20 and so forth. So binning or binning the data or the opposite, which is taking the bins and breaking them down, which is more difficult to do. But binning together data and creating groups is another way of, of modifying existing data. Changing variable game names, again, must be done if you have two redundant fields, you have no choice. Or if somebody like didn't really bother to put like nice variable names um, and you need to create them to better describe the data. Always, by the way, don't always like never delete like the original data. Save, save, save the original data and either do it like step by step or like save the original data and then keep a log of like everything you modified because you don't ever want to use, you, you don't ever want to lose the original data. Um, reformatting data, zip codes is a very common thing. Like maybe I still don't entirely understand the nine digit dip, zip codes, but maybe you want to have a five digit zip code because it's much easier to group your data and work with it. Um, and so you would just reformat it so the data was in five digits and not nine digits. That's fairly simple to do. This is not data cleaning. Again, the you know this is when everything is in nine-digit format, so it's consistent. Um, cleaning would be converting everything to the same the same format. This is already in the same format. Okay. Joining fields may be desired if, for example, I mean you can create you can have first name and last name being separate. Maybe you want to create them and have a full name because maybe you're. I mean, this would be more common, probably like a male label merge or something, but maybe you want to have first and last name in one column and not two, right? Splitting fields is the opposite of joining. Maybe you have them in two fields and maybe you want to split into first and last names. Okay. Always, always, always retain the original data. Don't make your original data disappear because you can't get it back if you delete it. Um, or maybe you can with some systems, but it's not a good idea. Um, Especially with quantitative data, you very often want to create groups. So if you have like data on heights or weights or whatever, you can do your basic univariate stats on that column, but to do like graphs and frequencies, you really need to bend that data. Excel will do it if you just right click and do the group by and the pivot table, but 
um, there's all kinds of ways to, to group data. A lot of software actually does have automated binning built into it. Um, it's not always simple to use, but I know like SPSS has this weird little visual binner thing that we look at in stats too. But um, so grouping data is very important. And, and when you group data um, with quantitative data, you're effectively making your quantitative data categorical when you have like a group because a height of 10 to 20 is no longer, um, that's now a group variable. You can kind of consider that categorical at this point. Okay. So this is an example of um, binning data. Okay. So for example, data and salaries can be converted to binary categories of greater than or less than or equal to. You can only have the equal to in one of these. You can't have it in both, right? So it's either, oops, I actually kind of did this wrong. I should put an equal there. But anyways, um, so if the salary is 27,000, it's less than 60. And if it's um, 78,000, it's not less than 60. So this is an example of creating a discrete variable, yes or no, from a salary continuous variable. And this is something that you need to do for um, this one you do need to do for a lot of the data mining techniques. Okay. And software, again, this is also another way that you could group salaries. So you can, this is creating a binary variable of yes or no with it. This one is creating ranges of groups like you would do for a histogram or a graph or chart. Excel does this fairly well. It's pretty easy to just do these in software. Um, you can do them by hand as well if you have custom categories or whatnot. Um, it's not too hard to usually bend data like this. Okay. Categorical data. Now this talks, this is all like salary data is a continuous quantitative variable, but you can also, if you have categorical data, um, you might want to group that too. So for example, if somebody collected pet data and you let them enter like their dogs and like whatever kind of dog that they have, um, maybe instead of like doing that you want to like group the group the types of pets into like cat and dog or even group the types of dogs into like large dog small dog um you know because people entered like you know very specific things and you want to have instead of like a hundred different specific things you want to have like 10 categories and so i mean you can look at the data and then kind of create the categories from there you can like preconceive but so don't get the idea that it's just quantitative data we group. We also will very often recategorize categorical data to make it a little bit simpler and easy to work with and understandable. If you think about it, if you're presenting data and you're presenting like 20 different categories, that's maybe too many. You might want to bin it down and get, make like six categories out of the 20. Okay. The third tier of data wrangling, and this is a precursor of the data wrangling course. So you can clean data at the individual level, then you can modify the fields, which is what we just talked about. You can also restructure the entire data set. Um, so data set restructuring is operating on the entire data table. Um, the first thing you can do here is make a different data type. And in R, there's usually a data frame, but converting this to something called a tibble with the tidyverse package would be an example of this. Um, ditto in Excel, because in Excel, things are typically sheets, but you can also kind of easily make them table format and that actually does alter like the properties of the data structure itself. Very commonly this business of long to wide and vice versa is done. This is when particularly you have a time column. If it's a time column and it's stacked, it's long like 1990 on top of 2000 on top of 2010, etc. But then you might want to split it out so that 1990 is one column and 2000 is one column. That's called wide. Um, it's typically done with time stuff. Part of it is that some analytics require that it be in a certain format. Like I know that repeated measures analysis in SPSS, you typically have to reformat your data to do it. Um, just because in some cases, SPSS is really old software and it will only take data in a certain form and you have to format it in that way. So converting long to white is actually something super common. And we will learn how to do this again in data wrangling. But we're not going to, this, all the stuff I'm talking about now, literally there's an entire seven week course on doing this um, because you do have to practice and work with it. But just to give you an idea of what steps you need to take when you pre-process data, you might have to clean it, you might have to alter the fields, and you might have to restructure the data set itself. Except not for this course because in this course we're just going to work with data that's already set up. Um, data wrangling covers an entire course in this. It's good stuff. Um, so other things you might want to do that are data restructuring is make aggregate data. And what that means essentially is make a summary table. 
sort of like ma basically making a pivot table. If you've done Excel and you take all the big data sheet and then you make a pivot table of just the averages or the counts, that's aggregated data. And you can analyze aggregated data. Aggregated data, like for example, you have data on um, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, and rather have the individual database of all the students, you create an aggregated database that has like the number of counts of each level of student, and then you have a simpler database, but it's still a database and you're still analyzing it. Um, the other thing that you can do and that we did in 101 a little is you can restructure data by joining in data from other sources, which very often, um, typically when I did work, and I did a lot of it because I did this for a long time, um, very typically when I worked with joins, I was very often just left joining in some additional variable that I needed that wasn't in my data which would be something like maybe I was working with data that had zip codes and towns. I would join in like the population numbers for that town or something like that. That is, um, that's actually, I mean, what I did, I don't know what everybody does, but very typically there was just some additional field I needed. So I would left join that field in to put it into the data. Um, yeah, okay. The other thing you can do is just make a smaller data set. Now this is different from aggregating. Making a smaller data set means like you have a hundred columns but you're only gonna need like five of them. So just like instead of you know using all 100 columns, make a smaller quote analytical file and just use that. Um, in the old days, this was actually important because it was really hard to work with like a huge data set because it would just be computationally intense and take a lot of time. So it was just very efficient. These days you don't necessarily have to make a smaller data set. It's just easier to work with. Um, Another way you might want to restructure is to filter your data in some way. And for example, maybe you have data and you only want to have people over 65, so you can filter by age and filter out that way. And then you would work with the restructured data set. So this again, this is all stuff data wrangling is going to do, on, but this is the stuff you might want to do before you pre-process. Because you might be doing data mining and you might only care about like certain age groups or something. So just pull out those groups and filter it. Um, so that would be data restructuring. Again, the data re wrangling course covers all the stuff and all the stuff will be actually done in that course and not here. Um, what we are gonna actually do in here is a little bit of data normalizing because data mining does use this all the time. And it's very simple. Normalization is also known as standardization. Standardization can actually mean a couple of other things, but for our purpose, they're the same making variables equal weight so that the measurement scale doesn't affect other computations. What this means is making z-scores, and here's what that means. This is the standard normal distribution. Um, even if you haven't had intro stats, it's just a basic probability curve. The area under the curve is one, but what's super important is the axis here is a z-axis. These are what's called standard scores. This is not an actual data axis, it's a reference distribution. And what you do is you take your data and you map it back to a z-score. And you can make z-scores out of any data that you can calculate a mean and standard deviation on. Um, so the standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But what's really important is that creates these z-score axes. These are called standard, standard scores or standard normal scores. But you can take any data and convert them to these z-scores. And we are actually going to do that in this course because when you do that, it then becomes independent of the measurement units in the data. So if your data is in, if you think about it, you could measure the same thing in height and inches. And if you did that, your your actual numbers are going to be different. Like I don't actually know how many inches is a centimeter. Um, I should probably look it up, but I don't know. I'm, I think it's like two two or three centimeters per inch. I don't know. I'm, I'm randomly guessing, but you could measure something in two different scales. But if you converted the same thing that you measured back to a z-score, you get the same z-score for the two different scales. So it becomes a scale-independent metric, which is what we want, which is why we're going to use this. It's very easy to do because the software will always, any software that you use is going to do this. Okay. And so this is the, the formula where you have any quantitative data. This is only for quantitative data. Categorical data, you're not going to, it's not numeric, so you're not going to do this. Um, but it can be continuous or discrete, and you can do this. So you find the mean, which is mu. That's the population mean, not the sample mean in the formula, but the same thing. And so you take the data, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, you always get a z-score. The z-score tells you um, how far the data is from the mean. So a z-score of 1 would indicate that you're one standard deviation from the mean. So if, 
if you converted to a z-score and got a z-score of zero, that would be the mean. If you got a z-score of one, that's one deviation above the mean. Okay. Here is um, the same data from last week, but the purpose here is not outliers, is to actually look at how to calculate the z-scores. So this is just like random data, um, 78, 85, whatever. The mean is just divide the data by the number of data values, which is 10, 87.7. The standard deviation, now they're actually using the population formula here. They shouldn't. They should use the sample formula, but um, this doesn't actually matter. Well, it does actually matter. They should be using the n minus 1, but I didn't notice that and I didn't fix it. Um, but anyways, they calculate the standard deviation, which is 7.76. And then what you do is you take the 78, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. So this right here, 78 is the first data value. The mean is 87.7, the standard deviation is 7.76. The formula is this, x minus mu over sigma. So they're subtracting the 78 minus the 87 divided by the 7.76. And then for each of the values, there's 10 data values, you get a z-score. So the z-score of minus 1.25, that would be about here. That test score is 78, the mean is 87, so that test score is 1.25. 25 standard deviations below the mean. So 1.25 times this is roughly 10. And so this is roughly 10 less than that. And that's what that means. But these z-scores become completely independent of the measurement scale. These are on a 0 to 100 test scale, but that wouldn't matter. You'd still get the same z-scores if you did like a 200-point scale or 500-point scale. So z-scores become completely independent of units of measurement, which is why they then standardize things so that if you're working with data that has centimeters in one column and inches in another, you make standard scores out of both of those measurements. And that is really super important for data mining because otherwise what will happen is like the bigger unit, which would be inches, is actually going to like dominate the analysis and you don't want that. You want to like even things out and use your standard scores. Okay. Most software will do this very, very easily. When in doubt, particularly in data mining, not so much in every other statistical thing, um, and you wouldn't, like, if you're just doing, like, descriptive stats and summaries, you actually wouldn't want to standardize stuff because you want to leave it in original units. But when in doubt, use normalized data and data mining. Okay. And then that's, this is the end of part one because I'm going to come back and talk about this whole dimensionality reduction thing. Okay.